Hey everyone, this is Ben with ColonarySecuritCarry.net. In my last video, I talked about um, my own personal experience with this disorder. And in this video, I'm going to talk to you just a little bit about what ColonarySecuritCarry is exactly and a little bit of the background and some just general facts about it. First of all, it's one of the types of physical urticarias. And uh, I'll just go ahead and say urticaria is just a, a, a name for hives. It's a medical term for hives. So when I say urticaria, just know that I'm saying hives. But it's a physical type of hives. And what researchers and doctors have done is they just kind of classified a branch of hives that, that form due to a physical response. And they just call those the physical urticarias. Some of those include like solar urticaria, where when you go out in the sun, some people have that. And they go out in the sun and they'll develop hives. People with cold urticaria, if they come in contact with something cold, it'll cause their skin to um, erupt in hives. Cholinergic urticaria, of course, is a hypersensitive response in your skin that um, occurs due to a heat stimulus. In other words, if you become hot from exercise, if you become anxious, if you take a hot shower, anything you do that increases your body temperature, whether it's something you're doing actively or even if you're just sitting passively and the room becomes hot. Anything that causes your body temperature to increase, especially to the point where you would sweat, can cause a reaction. And that's all cholinergic urticaria is. It's a type of hives that forms as a result of heat or increase of body temperature. And um, where it gets its name is cholinergic, just means related to acetylcholine. That's all that word means. Acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter in your body. And whenever you're getting ready to sweat, your body will send down neurotransmitter signals to your sweat glands, like your hypothalamus, telling your sweat glands to open and release the sweat to cool your body. That's the purpose of sweat. And acetylcholine is just one of those neurotransmitters that the body uses to do that. And when it's released, for some reason, when it's released at the sweat gland junction, um, it causes mast cells to degranulate, which means break down. And when the mast cells break down, histamine is released. That's what causes that itchy feeling, the redness, the prickly. That's histamine being released in your body. That's why dermatologists and so forth often prescribe antihistamines, try to combat that release of histamine. Most of them don't work very well, but sometimes it helps some people. And the other word, like I've already told you, urticaria, it's just a medical term for hives, which it comes from... Uh, a word called stinging nettle which is a plant when you got stung or pricked by it it would cause that prickly stinging sensation in your leg and so that's that's all the word urticaria means in my sometimes you'll hear me pronounce urticaria instead of urticaria and the reason is is because when i actually heard it a long time ago um that's the way i heard it at first was urticaria it's actually pronounced urticaria i guess you could pronounce it any way you want really but i think the technical way is supposed to be urticaria um, as far as the origins of this, hives have always probably existed. If you think about, you know, ancient books like the Bible, for example, in the book of Leviticus, that's the Old Testament, that's thousands of years old. The priests would examine people with various skin rashes and so forth. It talks about there. And there's some ancient medical literature that is also very old. One book called The Yellow Emperor's Inner Classic. Um, and that, that's an ancient Chinese text, and that talks about hives. And so hives in general have been around forever. As far as the physical urticaries, though, I, as medicine began to advance, I think doctors and researchers at that point, um, especially in the 17, 18, 1900s, began to identify certain characteristics with some types of hives. And so they said, hey, we're going to classify these based on some of these characteristics. And that's where you start to see the physical urticaria is being documented. In 1799, solar urticaria, I think, is the first reference to that. Now, cholinergic urticaria is in 1924 by a man named Duke, and it's just a reference in an article. And basically, it just talks about how hives were um, forming in result of a physical stimulus or physical activity. And that's probably the first reference. It's the first one I've ever been able to find that um, talks about cholinergic urticaria specifically. So 1924, probably the first known reference, but I would speculate that long before then it's existed, people just probably didn't know what it was. Now, um, as they began to study it a little more, they kind of developed uh, cholinergic urticaria, urticaria into certain subtypes. Um, one research article titled, uh, Cholinergic urticaria, pathogenesis-based categorization and its treatment options. 
uh, they categorize that into four different subtypes, which was cholinergic urticary with pleural occlusion, acquired hypohydrosis, sweat allergy, and idiopathic. That's what that research article, they classified it into four different types. And I'll talk about those four different types here in just a second. Another research article basically agreed, but they only had three subtypes, which was sweat hypersensitivity, anhydrosis, and idiopathic. Now, idiopathic, when they classify a, col a person with cholinergic urticaria as idiopathic, what they're saying is, we're idiots. We don't know what causes it. <laughs> That's really not what they're saying, but the word idiopathic just means literally they don't know what's causing the worst. For the people with pleural occlusion, they speculate that there might be something that's actually blocking their sweat glands. It could be something like, you know, skin protein or just some, something's blocking their sweat glands. With acquired hypohydrosis, you know, it's not uncommon at all for some people with cholinergic urticaria to have reduced sweat function or even no sweat function sometimes because, like I mentioned in the other video, whenever you become hot, instead of just going into sweat, what happens is you tend to break out in hives and get that itchy, prickly feeling. And then the sweat allergy, uh, some studies have, re have uh, researched and found that uh, some people have a sweat antigen and when they extract that sweat antigen and re-inject it, it causes a, a hypersensitive reaction in their body. So they speculate that there could be an actual antigen in the sweat of some people with cholinergic urticaria and that's what causes the reaction. I think all those are somewhat interesting. I don't know if I agree with them totally, but I'm not saying they're wrong, they could be right. I'll just tell you a couple things. I find the pleural occlusion thing somewhat interesting because if you think about it, there's some other diseases like miliaria, rubra, and um, what happens with that is your sweat glands become clogged with bacteria and it's called prickly heat. It's kind of like cholinergic urticaria, but it goes away on its own or you can treat it with um, antibiotics. So it's not the same as cholinergic urticaria, but the symptoms, people feel that sort of stinging, prickling feeling and it's, result, and it's due to that blockage of the sweat pores. So that makes it, you know, the poor occlusion thing sound possible and interesting. And I used to think that that's maybe what was wrong with me, but I no longer really think that because, you know, I've found that diet is the cause of mine, number one. And number two, I found that um, even when I would, you know, try scrubbing my skin, doing all sorts of things like that to try to really clear my sweat glands, clear my skin cells out, um, tried all sorts of things with that, never really helped. But I'm not saying that it, some people may not have it. They could, I don't know. In my case, I don't think so. And as far as the hypohydrosis type, what I think is interesting of that, I don't really think that's a proper subtype because I've had hypohydrosis where I could sweat, but it was very little. I've had anhydrosis where I could not sweat at all. And I've, I've, I can sweat now just great. So I've had sort of that range with throughout the time I've had cholinergic urticaria. So if you're going to classify me, I've had hypohydrosis and anhydrosis, and I've had perfectly normal sweat functioning. So I don't know. It's sort of a bizarre classification to me, but I definitely, you know, think that they should acknowledge that some people that have cholinergic urticaria have difficulty sweating. And then... Um, the idiopathic, that's just kind of a junk drawer term. We don't know what's causing your hives, but we don't think it's any of these others, so we'll just call it idiopathic. But, you know, a lot of researchers, I don't think really know what's causing this. They just try to classify it, describe its symptoms. Um, I don't really know what's causing, what causes it either. I think that, you know, in my case, even though I know the diet helps, I don't know exactly how diet was causing my symptoms. So, um, okay, now let's talk about the duration. How long are you going to have cholinergic you carry? And that's probably what you all want to know if you just found out you have this, right? Well, that's kind of tough to say because it can be anywhere from a few weeks, a few months, a few years, or several decades. Nobody really knows. In uh, one study on Medscape.com, uh, they cited a study where the average duration was seven and a half years. Now, I had it on and off for about 11 years. Some people on the forum on my website have had it for 30 years plus, and you know, some people have had it less. It's just really hard to say how long you're going to have it. Nobody really knows, but what I would say is don't get discouraged about it because there are ways to treat it. You know, I've been able to completely overcome my hive. Some people, they have it, but it's just a minor nuisance to them. They go on, they have a fulfilled life. And so rather than just stressing out about how long you'll have it, I would just encourage you instead just to look at ways that you can manage it. 
and you know it'll take care of itself eventually and just never give up hope even if you have the most severe case you've ever heard of it's horrible you know that's how i felt for a long time it would never go away never get better you just have to hang in there you have to have faith you have to just believe that it's going to get better or that things can get better because they can sometimes get better um so that's how long you can you know that's an idea of how long it lasts in some people but again it's just kind of all over the map there and you don't know how long it's going to last it can affect both men and women it's not just one gender men tend to have it a little bit more but you know women have it too on my forum i have all you know men women of all ages and they're there it happens in any geographical location on my website i get traffic from everywhere i get it from canada from you know africa wherever i mean united states mexico i get worldwide traffic pretty much anywhere that's habitable where they have internet access i'll probably get traffic from there and people on the forum have reported living in hot climates cold climates a lot of people from the uk a lot of people you know from the united states i live in tennessee so you know it's pretty we have pretty warm summers and cold winters but um it can happen to any any skin color or race whatever you want to say we would just have one race right the human race but it can happen to any black white asian hispanic mediterranean whatever everyone seems that it seems to affect everyone anyone can be cursed with it i guess you could say um it can occur just about any time in your life there's been people with young children almost infant size i think the youngest i've ever seen on my forum is 20 months that had this 20 months old some people have had it in their 60s and 70s the most common age where people tend to develop this is in the late teens or early 20s and that's was certainly true in my case i got it at age 18. And so that kind of gives you an idea of when people uh, tend to develop this. Um, as, is this going to affect your lifespan? Probably not. You know, like I said, I've had it on and off for 11 years. Some people have had it as much as 30. In general, I don't think cold go to carry is really going to do anything to you. There are some exceptions, and I don't want to, like, scare you or anything. But, um, for example, if you take antihistamines for a really long time, some studies, like one came out I think a couple years ago that said if you take antihistamines that you could have a higher risk of brain cancer because they found that histamine does something in the brain and when you take antihistamines it could give you a slightly higher risk for brain cancer. That's not, that doesn't mean if you take antihistamines you're going to get brain cancer, but it just might be a slightly higher risk. Um, it's rare, but some people can have what's called an anaphylactic reaction. And that's if you have a severe case of hives and you, um, you know, you're exercising and suddenly your throat begins to swell, your lips swell, and you can't breathe. You could, you could theoretically die from that. Now, if you are at risk for that, you can get something called an EpiPen from your doctor. And that's, uh, I think, norepinephrine is what it's called. And you can inject yourself with that if you ever have one of those severe reactions. And that opens up your windpipe and helps you to breathe and so forth again. So you could die from, you know, maybe a slightly risk cancer if you if you do uh, antihistamines or like if you did some other crazy new radical treatments and it gave you a risk for cancer. So in that sense, it could affect lifespan. It could affect it in the sense that if you drop dead from anaphylactic reaction and very rarely cholinergic urticaria has been associated with like a cancer. And I've, I'll talk about that in my book, but there are a couple of cancer or one or two cancers i think that it's been associated with hairy cell leukemia was one or something and that seems to be really rare too but you know if you're concerned about that you can always get a checkup i always recommend you know you might want to get your blood counts and all that stuff checked i just had a checkup about six months ago and you know all my stuff came back great but uh it's very rare the average person with coronary acute carry it probably does not have cancer okay so don't stress out too much but if it's something you're concerned about so those are the four exceptions the if you have a risk of uh, uh, if you have a malignancy which is rare if you have anaphylactic shock if you have if you're taking um medicine that could cause it that's just three i think that's all i said wasn't it okay so that's three um and I'll talk about treatments and the causes, some of the causes out there. I'll talk about that in another video. Um, signs and symptoms, you know, 
you, if you have this, you already probably know what the symptoms are. But I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna make a whole video on symptoms. But the symptoms are you can get redness, which is flushing. Um, Colonic urticaria can affect any part of your body, but it seems to most commonly affect the upper torso, probably because that's where most of your blood and organs and so forth is. So it, your body becomes hottest there, and so you know you can get itchy, prickly sensation. Um, not all people with it get the itching. Some people just actually have visible hives and redness and it doesn't itch at all. And I always said they were the lucky ones because with me, that was the worst part was just that stinging, prickling. You just want to peel your skin off or ugh, it's just horrible. Um, you can have kind of wheeling as you're having a reaction where when you're scratching yourself, it can leave like really red marks or maybe a raised red mark. They call that a wheel. Um, so you can have wheels, you can have small pinpoint hives they're really small like if you took an ink pen and just made some dots on you some of them can be that small and they can be a little larger than that but uh, they usually don't get very large with this type of hives some people just have the redness and they don't get hives when i first got it that's what i got my skin would get my skin would itch and like crazy but it would just kind of get real red and then after a few months after a month or two i kind of noticed a few hives and then when it came back the second time, I would get really dramatic looking hives. And in fact, in the first, in the front cover of my book, like I've said before, that's a picture of it. If you go look at it on my website or on amazon.com, a large up close of it, you'll see that I have a lot of little cluster of hives if you want to see what they look like. And uh, those symptoms usually come on quickly whenever you, you know, get hot, whether you're in a hot shower, outside in the sun or whatever, whatever makes you hot, whenever you get hot, those symptoms can come on very rapidly. If you can get cool very quickly, you can usually uh, escape the reaction and it will die down. So like there's been actually times where I've just went, I've started having a really bad reaction. I just went and jumped in a cold shower and it just stops it. Once you have the reaction, um, this all the redness, itching, hives, anything you developed probably will disappear within 15 minutes. I mean, and it's gone. You'll look like you've never had anything wrong with you. That was, I think, that's a that's a big problem with people going to the doctors because, you know, you're trying to show this doctor, hey, you know, I'm having all this stuff go on with me, and they look at you and you look perfectly healthy, right? Unless you're having a reaction in front of them. And one thing you can do, you can try to take pictures of yourself when you have this reaction and take that with you. That may help a doctor diagnose you and it's going to be hard sometimes to find a doctor that is familiar with the condition because it's relatively rare i don't know how many people have it it's fairly common a couple studies have said it i think it was like let me see i, I forget the percentage it's a fairly it's a fairly common percentage of people in dermatology clinics though reporting a type of hives it was a pretty high percentage of people having this type of hives i know that on my website alone you know, I don't, I get some traffic from other, other articles I've written on it, but with cholinergic urticaria, I know that on Google's keyword search, you can see how many people search a certain term per month. It usually gets around, I think, 5,000, that exact term, cholinergic urticaria. So that's not always the, the amount of sufferers in the world because you know, people may be just researching it or they may have a friend or something that has it or, and there's a lot of people that don't have a clue what's wrong with them, which I didn't have a clue what was wrong with me for a long time either. So it's really hard to put a number on how many people have this, but I wouldn't suspect that it's a huge number. It's just hard to say really, nobody really knows the exact number. So I think that's gonna be it for this video. That's just a little bit about it. And some other videos, I'm gonna talk more in detail about the symptoms. I may show you some images or something from when I had these symptoms back in the day. I'm gonna talk about some of the treatments and all that. So definitely uh, keep checking out these videos and I hope they help you. And thank you so much for watching. God bless.